Welcome to the Human Design Collective podcast, where we explore this system as a unique map of our potential, from the mundane to the mystical. The Human Design Collective will be offering a Living Your Design deep dive for generators with our friend and colleague Blossom Benedict, starting October 12th as an eight-week live course. Rave ABCs begins November 10th, 2021, and Rave Cartography in January 2022 with John Cole and Amy Lee. Today we speak with Chaitanya, who runs the Chaitanya FX Human Design Facebook page, one of the most active on social media. If you take a look, you'll likely learn more about your design, see a lot of commentary, and find yourself laughing out loud. We're excited to meet with the man behind the page again today to discuss Ra's concept of no choice, witness consciousness, the trajectory of our lives, and the effect of relationship on that movement, among other things. We hope you enjoy his grounding depth and presence. We were just talking a moment ago before we started the recording, and one of the things that came up was this idea that often there's a movement or something in process, a flow in a certain direction, and the mind will try to figure out what it is or will interpret it. And oftentimes it ends up being something else. And one of the things that Ra kind of pointed out is we really don't know why we meet people, why we connect and why a lot of things that happen, why they actually are happening. And the mind will always try to come up with a story or a narrative around it. I thought that might be kind of interesting to start with today. Yes. What better topic? (laughs) (laughs) Amy, what was the actual... Well, I was just thinking about how we can meet something or there's a certain energy that shows up and just the mind is so good at coming up with explanations and reasons and justifications for why something's happening or why we're choosing to do something. I loved the way that Ross said that because it was sort of like, you might think that this person is in your life because you, you know, or whatever, you're making money together, you're raising children together, you're, you're doing some kind of project together, but then there could be a whole nother flow that's happening underneath that and a whole other set of movements through time and space that are taking you both somewhere that has really nothing to do with whatever your mind has come up with to justify the relationship or the interaction. Well, absolutely. (laughs) And the question is, I think you covered it. That's that's exactly right. Oftentimes people will show up uh, in sessions and readings and it's almost like they're not quite sure why they're there. Someone said, you should check out human design or they're into astrology. They saw it on Instagram or something. In that case, the mind will basically have its own story around it. It could just be fractal. How do you guys see that? Well, I think your, your design is really interesting as a, with that channel of initiation that you have, because underneath whatever the conversation or communication is between you and somebody else, there's that energy of that initiation channel, which has an effect. Right. That may have nothing to do with what you're actually talking about. <laughs> yeah, I often feel that. <laughs> yeah. My take is that we really have no idea. And I don't anyway. I don't know about we. But more and more, it's really day to day. And I can see how the mind tries to connect the dots and have a story because it's comfortable with the story. Mm-hmm. And we need that familiarity. Okay, this is leading to that. You know, it has a logical progression, right? Mm -hmm. The mind likes that. So I let it do that. I think it's okay. Let the mind do it. But you're not going to buy it, right? The trick is to be entertained by the storyline, but not to necessarily join in on it. (laughs) So there has to be a little bit of a buffer where you're watching it. You know, this is like the buffer in awareness. So you're aware of the story, but you know, you really can't count on the story. And the way I look at it, it's funny that the topic came up because I thought about it the other day. And just looking back how all the critical major events in my life, I had no idea about the true reason that they happened. Looking back now, like let's say things that happened 15 years ago, 20 years ago. At the time, mind was like, oh, yeah, this is happening because of this. But, <laughs> but then later, it's like, oh, no, if that wouldn't have happened. These other things wouldn't have happened. It was just a story to keep the mind, you know, occupied and and the form was just going along whatever the actual ride was going to be eventually. So absolutely, I think we have no idea. At the time, I thought, you know, one of the most interesting things is that people want to have this 
spontaneity and adventure and the surprise. But man, you know, we're not really ready for that. We, we want certainty. We want to make sure it's going to happen again. <laughs> we want to make sure one plus one is always two. Yeah, we want to surprise as long as it's something that we know <laughs> <Control>. about. <laughs> right? We, you know, we've got to be in control of that. But letting go of that is one of those things. It has to be a happening. I don't think we can actually do that. It happens just by trusting. They say trust the process, right? Well, for me, it's easy. I do a lot of historical research and cycles and things. So it's easy to look back and say, oh, you know what? These things happen. Therefore, the probability is that it's going to continue to happen in the future in a certain fashion. So when I look back in my life, I see the same thing. It's like certain things happen and they lead to some kind of unfoldment. And I don't have to know that. And that little part, it, it sounds so simple, but man, you know, the mind just doesn't let up. <laughs> so my thing is like, don't worry about it. As long as we know what the mind is doing, let it do its thing. Just like breathing. We don't know what the lung is doing every second, but we don't have to know it. We know that's what it does. You know, we have eyelids that are blinking, eyes are blinking. It, we don't have to worry about it. And so I treat the mind-brain complex as an organ, which it is, and let it do its thing. And it needs a narrative. It needs a storyline. Let it have it. Long as you can keep that distance, you know, have a little buffer where you don't get sucked into the vacuum <laughs> or the flow of the storyline, and you want to stay in the storyline of, of your life in the moment. Everything happens in the now. There's no, really, there's no really tomorrow, and there's no real yesterday. And the way I came to that is just think about how much you can remember in your past. It's all spotty and blotchy, right? If you go back two weeks, you're not going to remember every day exactly what happened. You're not. Barely from this morning. So what about seven years ago? What about seven years ago, the second Tuesday of March? No, there's no way. And I think there's a reason why we can't. We don't have the capacity because we're supposed to be in the now, experiencing now, right? The flow in the now. So we don't have to worry about the future. Why? Because we don't have that capacity. It's really easy. We don't have that ability built in, but we want it just for the thrills, but we don't have it. And we don't have this amazing retention like, like a computer going back, you know, what happened two days after our birth. No way. We don't know that. <laughs> and I think, I think there's a reason for that. We're not supposed to. It doesn't matter. You're here for the now. Experience it in the flow. Take it in and you know, that's the real enjoyment, right? The thrill is really in the now, man. It's like a roller coaster, you know, and you don't know what's coming around the corner. It's funny you touched on that because it's something that was just crossing my mind a few days ago or a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And if, if you look at it from the point of view of the form or the body, the, the body is always in the now. I mean, there, where else could the body be? But right <laughs> here, right now, where I am. But the mind, on the other hand, can go into the future, can go in the past. You know, it has a range that the body doesn't have. And what comes to mind for me in this conversation is also this parallel with, you know, you could say working with the human design system where it's such a deep, extensive and rich body of knowledge. And yet the, the point of it all really is to get us back into our bodies and into form consciousness. You could say, you know, it, it gives the mind something to chew on. In the meantime, or to to entertain itself, you know, all of the details, all of the substructure, and all these places that we go on Facebook and our discussions, and, and yet here we are, you know, right now. Yeah, I think I think we tend to overlook that and how cool that is. That, that natural state, you I know, mean, that's our state. I, I feel like that's the state in the now, with all the knowing, but operating in the now. And the mind has its own cycle. You know, sometimes it's a little chatty, sometimes it's quiet. Sometimes it's, you know, in the future, sometimes in the past. So it has its own thing. So you let it do its thing. It's like, and, and you live your life through the experience while being entertained by that, by what's happening there. But I think the mind also adapts to the form. Well, as the form changes, the mind also changes because the body chemistry changes, brain chemistry changes. So it also is a moving sort of evolving thing. And it does get quiet. I think sometimes the mind just gets to a point of like, wow, I really don't know. And let's just watch. <laughs> Maybe mind actually might align with you at times. And I think that's the state that, you know, all the yogis and, you know, the Buddhas, everybody was searching to be in that state of in the now, in the flow. Yeah. And the mind 
in line with the body, in line with the form, right? Having that congruence. I'm not sure where else to go after that, but it's, it's a good spot. <laughs> it's a good spot to be. And with a certain amount of humor and detachment, it makes it a lot easier. I was thinking about that. Uh, I was just talking with a friend of mine who recently was given a terminal cancer diagnosis and she's a six line and she's got this really kind almost bizarre level of adventure and optimism about her journey through this disease, through this experience of, of a disease. And we were talking the other day about the story, I don't know if you guys ever read this story to your children, but there's a, there's a book that was really popular for a while called Zen Shorts. And they had that Zen story about the, you know, the farmer and his son and son breaks his leg and everybody says, oh, how terrible. And, and he says, we'll see. And then, you know, somebody brings him a bunch of money and everybody says, how wonderful. And he says, oh, we'll see. And there's something about that kind of a bit of humor and detachment in relation to the way events unfold in terms of us using our supposed agency and will to kind of go after things and make things continuous and make sense. And then find that there are these moments when things don't make sense or they don't go the way we planned or something unexpected happens and we can sort of curse it or we can celebrate it or we can just kind of watch it and be like, huh, how interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now what? I love that story. I think it, it helps. Yeah, that's me. a great story. It, it's about how uh, his son broke the leg and then the army came and they couldn't take right. him. Right. He had a broke the leg, right? And then yeah. He was on. yeah. yeah. We, we don't always know what's coming. I feel like at first it can be really maddening to not be in control. And then it's kind of liberating. Like you said, there's a surprise element to it that makes it way more interesting than it would be if we were in control of everything. You know, nothing clarifies things like thinking about death, right? At least for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You think, wow, lights out, then what? Then <laughs> when I think about it in terms of lights out, zero, there's nothing after that, consciously anyway, at least in this form. Then man, you know, even all the pain is kind of cool. Whatever that mind we comes into this fortune, misfortune, positive, negative, it really doesn't matter. The fact that we, hey, we got to come into a form and experience something even for a month. Wow. You know, we go on vacation and think it's like amazing. I mean, Jesus, <laughs> you know, here we come into a form and just play in this amazing <laughs> place. And then we're complaining about stuff, right? Yeah. It's just, that's, that's kind of a sad thing, but yeah, uh, that's just how it is, what to do. Yeah. But perspective is everything. If you kind of shift it to look, you see the light lights out or this. Well, this is not bad. Even you know, I've been through the entire, you know, the, pretty much the whole spectrum of up to down to sideways. To, and looking back, it's you know, all of it's good. Mm -hmm. It's better than lights out. You know, that's that's my take. Mm -hmm. it, you know, you got to appreciate that. I think it, it's I do. <laughs> like, yeah. Because it's so special, right? You can't, I can't, you can't make any more special. I thought, because I have a friend who went blind mm -hmm. and I thought, wow, and he's out of vision. And, and I thought, wow, you know, what a, what a way to slam somebody. No, it's bad enough that he's blind. But then I thought, you know, there are hundreds and thousands of people in all kinds of positions, all kinds of disabilities, limitations, and so on. and any one of us could be that any day. We don't know. Yeah. And I thought, well, you know, what if that happens? And I thought, you know, so what? <laughs> we got to come and play, right? We got to experience all of this. Mm -hmm. So if we drop dead tomorrow, I'm, I'm fine. It was fun while it lasted, right? <laughs> <laughs> so not to get down on death, but, you know, <laughs> just, to, just to, to show how special this is. There's no better comparison, contrast, because I think we get too hooked into life and, you know, all the conditioning around how happy we have to be and how everything has to be perfect. And everything has to be lined up and everything has to be effortless. I think we're asking a lot for what we've been given. <laughs> right. And we're actually not that comfortable with death, with endings. I mean, if you look at, you know, maybe modern medicine and how everything is geared towards 
keeping people alive at all cost, you know, under any yeah. circumstances. And I wonder how that, you know, just kind of fits into, you know, to the mindset of living, living now or living in the present, like we were talking about earlier. I think that's the product of that kind of thinking, which I think it's necessary. I mean, you know, if you get sick, it's good to have some medicine. If you need an operation, it's good to have the technology. I think that's all fair game and it's part of our advancement. But the internal state is another, you know, another story. I think you're on your own when it comes to your connection with your body, with your form, or the, I would say the alignment of the mind and form working together or in, being in line. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, <laughs> what can you say? Well, I'm actually curious about, you mentioned pain. And we were recently talking with uh, Martin Grassinger, and he had made a comment. We had asked him, well, how did you, like, what was the most impactful thing for you in learning about being aware of your emotional process or connecting with your emotional process? What what helped you to connect with that? And he said, pain. It made me curious in hearing you talk because there's such an equanimity that comes through you with the emotional definition that you have and just your, your experience as you've you know, moved through life. Can you speak to how you look at the emotional process and pain and your own experience of that or how that's evolved throughout your life? You know, the way Ra would talk about the emotional, the emotional process has this, you know, wave, pleasure to pain, pleasure to pain. Yeah, I haven't had a lot of pain, honestly. <laughs> Knock on wood. <laughs> Might get some tomorrow, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I really can't. It's just, you're talking about emotional pain, eh? not, not physical pain. Either, but yeah, probably more emotional on the emotional level. No, other than, you know, when you're a kid, you don't get what you want. You cry a little bit, something like that, but not no real, because I have this, somehow the mind just always makes sense out of whatever happened. So there's, it all just dissolves very quickly. Mm. And I don't have this deep depth, like some of these, you know, depth of, I don't have a depth of emotions. I think we talked about it last time. Mm -hmm. I don't have a depth like some of these, you know, people with a lot of individuality and, and, uh, Let's just say gate 55 or 22, you know, mm -hmm. this kind of stuff where you can feel very deeply. I don't do that on my own. I can be led there. <laughs> but for me, everything sort of dissipates in some kind of reason or logic, mm -hmm. uh, which is probably my mind survival uh, mechanism to quickly make sense out of it. Say, oh, that's okay. That's because of that and that and the other thing. Mm -hmm. And then everything, so it never gets to that point of, oh my God, you know, that, that threshold where you just lose it or it's sort of uncontrollable pain and, and there's no way out. There's, a, you know, there's a fine line there. So somehow I kind of always skate on top of it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know for how long, but, you know, and I never really talked about it up until right now. It, it's really, I feel like that's what it is. It, it mm. just, comes up with reasons and, and it has some kind of a logic behind whatever happened, which dissipates getting into the other avenue over there, you know, with pain. Wow. And, uh, and physical pain, even physical pain, what I've noticed is it comes and goes, usually. But pain doesn't, you know, it doesn't bother me. I, I have a pretty decent threshold and, and I don't try to read too much into it. We're bioforms. I mean, Jesus, something's going to hurt. <laughs> <laughs> so so is it that the wave is there the, the the low parts of the wave are there the pain is there but is it what you're saying that maybe the acceptance of it or the the lack of resistance to it that mean that that kind of translates into a more kind of balanced or a less intense experience or you just don't experience the lows there that you have a pretty steady wave is yeah it's a steady wave because i don't really experience epic highs either you know and i don't experience the really dark and narrow lows it's it's really more low amplitude around the zero line <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i don't have the high amplitude waves they're they're low once in a while it might dip down but then it's just just 
melancholy kind of a thing, which I normally end up doing something creative just as a natural thing, not like forcing myself. But I haven't really had that. Maybe it's not my turn this time around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty flat, which is not all that great either, right? Because you don't get the thrill of the up and the down. I like what the way you the way you explain that. I hadn't thought about that before. The way you just described it, even the way the mind can sort of come in to interpret and experience. The way you just said it to me made made me see the mind as a sort of gift, or like you said, a way of being able to cope with the experiences as they're happening. You know, we often so much we talk about mind in relation to human design. Talk about the pain in the ass that it is, but it's interesting to see it as something that can be a sort of a help or a way to not get lost potentially in the experience of the moment. And, and I think it comes not just me, but just watching people around me, like the kids is dangerous. No, what did you say? It's a mess or something to deal with in human design. It's a pain in the ass. <laughs> pain in the ass right. So, and I think the reason it's like that, it's because it's been misguided, right? So it, it's it's the conditioning that brings it to that level. But if you just leave it alone in the wild and feed it and take care of it, it knows what to do and it matures and it, it handles everything pretty well. And that's what I've noticed in my kids who, I would say 95% of their life, they grew up with human design, meaning not that they were studying or anything, just that they were treated properly and they were fed properly sort of dietary hygiene, I would say, and, and how you maintain your space and environment has a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. Because just think, if you're in the wrong place, your mind's not going to be working well. It's not going to act right. It's just everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. So how can we not be in the right environment, not feed it properly or deform properly and expect everything to be functioning perfectly, right? Mm -hmm. just, so you have to put all the pieces together, I think. Otherwise, it's... it's um, now firing on all the cylinders. <laughs> I, I think the pain in the ass part is because we don't, we're not sure and it's not letting go of its grip. We totally bought into the stories and, you know, it's like Velcro, man. You know, you're going to have to peel it off <laughs> <laughs> over time, right? Slowly. Mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of PHS and the environment because I think those two things have other properties that we haven't, we don't really understand. I think those things are critical. For, for mind and emotions and because it's otherwise we'll be talking to this talking about the emotions and mind and everything till the end of time mm -hmm. or we can just treat it properly and get on with life <laughs> right yeah. because solutions are very easy we know what to do now it's not like we have to wonder about it it takes time for everything to prove something to yourself it takes time yeah and it's probably no coincidence that those are the first two transformational steps dietary regimen and you know correct environment absolutely yeah you know, that's no mistake <laughs> that's, mm -hmm. and i think without dietary you might not even get to the environment you know right. you really have to sort of feed that and i you know there's a lot of you know if you talk about this in a the group there's always 20 percent that's like ah, no no we don't have to worry about phs and 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 that might be true for some you know what i'm also learning is you know, the hard rules are not for everyone. There is a bell curve there, and some people fit on one end of the tail. Others are going to be on the other end of the tail. And um, there's always people that get through the gaps or the cracks, and they do fine. But majority, no. I, I think you really have to treat your body correctly in the form. You just mentioned the group. I, I assume you meant the Facebook group that you recently started. Thank you for inviting me to be a part mm -hmm. of that, first of all. I noticed that when you set the group up, you established that there were kind of certain uh, guidelines or you know, maybe <laughs> rules or expectations that came with being a part of the group. How's that been going? Are you finding that, that that's something that people will generally follow or they appreciate? Or is it um, kind of like most other things on social media? Actually, it's pretty good. It's surprisingly good. And I think there's like 99% compliance. <laughs> so what can I say? But, you know, they weren't like, you know, you know, I wasn't asking, it wasn't really asking for miracles. It was very basic 
basic thing. <laughs> so I, I hope they can manage that, most people, right? It was very basic. And to keep it entertaining. So no, they're, they're, they're doing okay. Everybody's okay. Because I think everybody wants a clean uh, environment to talk about things and not be bombed with all kinds of nonsense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think those that are drawn to that kind of, a, I think they appreciate it. Can you share yeah. with us some of what you're seeing through that, um, through that format or what, what kind of patterns you're seeing or, or what people are talking well, about? You know, the big difference was that I wanted a group that didn't spend a lot of time talking about the basics. Mm -hmm. Because we, you know, every group, you know, when you mix a bunch of people up together, you know, we're hammering in every direction. And, it's, and the topics tend to be on the, uh, let's just say, starter levels. And there are, I think last time I checked a couple of weeks ago, there are over 100 Facebook groups in Facebook, not to mention all these other groups all around. I'm talking about human design groups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are specialized, which is fine. And, and a lot of them are open for everybody. And there are a lot of for beginners and starters. So, so what I wanted was something a little bit more oriented towards people that have been in the process for a while. Mm -hmm. let's say three, four years or so, three, at least three and a half, four years. And they're committed by, you know, by four years, if you're not committed, you know, you're more or less committed <laughs> at the fourth year. Mm -hmm. But then a whole another kind of uh, set of questions come up at that point. Because, you know, the type of questions the mind comes up with changes mm -hmm. over time. So what I wanted to see was what's at the other end of the questions, just to feel those. And listen to those comments and insights and share them with other people and what everybody else has to say. So I would say what we have is kind of a group that's mature in the process, at least in time. Mm -hmm. So they have different questions and needs and curiosities and things to share. And, and, and so far, it's, it seems okay. <laughs> well, I'm sure it's something that people really appreciate to have that kind of a format. and. Uh, it's funny you mentioned having like some some sort of basic parameters and it's generally not a big ask. And yet when you look at the broad population, sometimes <laughs> it seems that it is a big ask, apparently. So, um, well, the thing is, if they're OK with those simple requirements, then everything's fine. If you're not, then you're probably early in the process. Mm -hmm. You know, that's when you're coming to a group, you're challenging everything and wondering what this is and that is without really uh, going through the process and looking within before you start looking without. I think over time, at least around four years, I think you've, you've looked within. I think this kind of a format gives you, gives you a chance to share that. You know, there's a lot of cool things that I would never realize or anybody unless somebody with that, their unique perspective gets a chance to share it. Mm -hmm. So, and I think there's a lot of pearls there. I'd hate to have not anyone hear those. And that's really, that's probably the selfish reason is that, that I wanted to do it. <laughs> probably just to, just to hear what everybody has to say. Mm -hmm. And that's starting to happen. And it's only, you know, this, this group is very new, but it's starting to happen. It's great. I like it. You know, moving towards 2027 and even why, if we can answer that question, I don't know, but why human design came into the world through raw at the time that it did, is it to assist in this in this transition, this mutation that's happening right now in the world that that we're all a part of? You know, it feels to me this information is here for a reason, and we're seeing out in the collective or in the field that uh, this is probably my particular bias and bent, but. It feels more important than ever to get this information out and to get people connected back to themselves, to their own inner authority, to their bodies, to their present experience, like we were talking about earlier. I mean, are we running out of time? Mm, probably. <laughs> we're, running out. we're always running out of time. <laughs> so. Are we too late? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think we are. <laughs> I think we're late. It, it does always feel like I'm... <laughs> I'm behind schedule somehow. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I, I don't know. I, I used to have a, uh, personally, I used to have that kind of a view on things, you know, gosh, this should be out. Everybody should hear it. 
and it's gotten less and less so. Hmm. Yeah. And um, because I think this kind of data dumps have happened before. You know, I think if you look back, this information happens every so often to different people. And it'll be, and sometimes it's huge, like what happened to Ra or Buddha or these other people. Sometimes it's not so big, but it's a narrow slice. But it's also some kind of a data leak or data dump that comes through. What I've noticed in the pattern is usually people that are around benefits during that timeline of that person being around. So during Ra's time, you know, he had that really, the, who were the closest in the fractal, I would say. They picked it up and they benefited and they transmitted it or they had children and they leave that imprint. Mm -hmm. And it might carry on and it's going to get diluted and changed, but there'll be one line that's going to carry it. And, you know, those that are meant to resonate with it are meant to get it, will get it. And, and I think it's always been the case if you look back. And, and I think it's the case with, with this information. I think it, it, it really depends on what we do. If, you, if somebody takes the initiative to do something like, let's say this write some kind of a all-encompassing uh, manual, let's just say, right? Okay, so somebody did it. And then it happened. And whoever wants to check it will check it. But I don't know if there's a pressure to, in that sense, to get it out. I think it'll be nice, but I'm fairly convinced. And I think Raul was too towards the end that, hey, if you're going to get it, you're going to get it one or the other. And that's just how it is. And, and I think, yeah, I, I think, just think that's how it is. Because you know people that it's amazing how the fractal lines work. Eh? It's just incredible <laughs> because you could be, two inches from somebody that really needs it, but they're not ready for it. And how do you explain that? You would think, for whatever reason, if you were that close, it was meant to get transmitted. And maybe somehow it was, oracularly, but you would think. But I see these sort of, you know, ships at night, ships in the dark, just passing. Mm -hmm. And wow, it's the craziest things to watch. But now it's normal. I don't think it's, I just think that's just how it is. And then you pass this all the time, all the time. And then once in a while, uh, somebody will come up and it's there, they're correct. It's the right time. Timing is right. And they're open and, and they get to hear it. And even then, there's no chance of them following through. Mm -hmm. So the ones that really get through all the hoops, man, you know, my hats are off. <laughs> and that's part of the reason for the group. You know, if you can hang in there for four years and get through all the, all the obstacles that get thrown, you know, you're special. Right. And, mm -hmm. and that those people need support. Yeah. Yeah. You need to get it out, too. I, I get that. Do that also. But I think the survivors <laughs> should <laughs> definitely be given some support. Yeah. Uh, not for surviving, but, it's, you know, it's, it's a cut. You have to make the cut. You have to get through the obstacle. Not all of life circumstances are supported at the beginning anyway, or seemingly. It's a struggle, right? Oh, Forget yeah. them mental obstacles but just the physical nature of how we have to change and the people and the families and partners and children and jobs if you take all that into account all those variables if you can get into the experiment for three years it's a miracle yeah yeah, yeah. We, we were just and, talking about that just the the way that uh to, to really start to to go through a deconditioning process or to watch how this kind of a shift of of awareness and and functioning can can just start to really rearrange everything in your life it can be quite a massive undertaking and absolutely even under the best of circumstances even in the best of circumstances yeah right. and so. and very humbling you know it's a very humbling experience for me to me i think um but it's it's making me think about cuz we've been talking about this potential of a sort of broader collective universalized way of accessing things. And I'm thinking about the way Ra at some point had said, you know, the, this is going to get transmitted one-to-one, -one, you know, individual to individual. What do you see about that? I think that's true. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah uh, I'm in agreement. I think uh, that's really the way. Mm -hmm. I think the online, the mass sort of distribution is okay mm -hmm. to sort of get the, get the toes wet or some kind of initiation. Mm -hmm. But at some point, that one-to-one -one seems like it will help. Yeah. Right? Yep. I and, so. and I think it'll happen much 
faster or in a more uh, in a better way if well to the degree that people are living correctly is to the degree that it'll transmit faster or more efficiently because the correct people will be drawn to you and instead of having two correct people a month it, be, it might be 10 correct people a month that bump into you because that's getting drawn in mm -hmm. because of you grounded in your own frequency right so yeah i think there's a lot to be said but i think that's what he really meant it's not like going around one-to-one -one talking to everybody it's really really you living correctly and then those who are correct for that frequency will will show up and they do yeah yeah something that we've been both emphasizing in the classes and the teaching but also in individual sessions that when when you have definition you're talking about something very very specific you know and if you go and you look at the substructure and how with say gate 43 it looks like okay gate 43 is activated but it's activated in one out of 1080 different possible ways and so it is something that's very very specific and i and i think that's often lost when we're looking at like the body graph on the surface you know of how specific and you could even say kind of limited that particular definition or frequency is yes absolutely i mean it varies a little bit there's some space to modulate because they, they're not 2D environments, say eh? they're multidimensional. So yeah, you might get one flavor on this side, another one on another side. So I, I think those, let's just say micro divisions, yeah, they narrow it down. But I think even in that narrow space, there's plenty of variety if you look around it. Because if you look, treat it like a sphere, for example, instead of a pipe. So in, ha in terms of how it's that particular frequency is interacting with maybe the the transit program or the person that you're with orically, there's going to be variations based on that as well. Mm -hmm. If you follow what I'm saying. Well, plus it's how, how it all gets blended at the end before it comes to your cognition, right? Before you become to realize it, before it gets into the neocortex, everything gets get into a fine blend from this and that and all these right. thousands of different variables has to mesh up to something. Right. And then it gets, structured and then out for you to look at and that out for you to look at is i think it's where the the standardization happens is in the hard neural pathways and the chemistry because neural pathways you have patterns of thinking patterns of thinking i think limitations probably there not in the at the at the line gate level or the color levels because it's that stuff is open there's no nothing you know there, there are receptors like in mini vacuums, right? Yeah, maybe for certain different size particles, but it's at least it's, it's taking it all in. But I think limiting fact is how the neural pathways operate in processing that mm -hmm. and the brain chemistry. No matter what the experience, it gets a standardized, like, oh, storyline, because all that has to fit into a storyline too. And that's why I think this decondition, well, that's not, it's really why. It's why deconditioning takes so long. It takes seven years minimum because those pathways have to adjust, readjust, have new pathways grow, because you're not entertaining those same old traumas or the same old mm. ways of thinking and making decisions. So I think the limitations there, I don't think at the gate level, what I think, I can reason it out in a logical way. But it all comes back to the uh, cognitive structure. I think that's why we have to take care of it, have it be mm -hmm. flexible. <laughs> So it can grow, it can continue to make new pathways and new decisions and new ways of looking at things. So this is why mental decisions are not good because you're, it could be, you know, if you had a traumatic life or had some huge trauma that draws in that thinking about that, talking about that trauma hardens certain pathways. So if your decisions are based on, also gets processed through those pathways, then they're always gonna be biased towards that, whatever that trauma was. Not just the trauma, it could be, you know, anything really. But it gets standardized in, in that way. So part of deconditioning is to not use them so they, so they start to decouple. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, we grow new ones to adapt to the new, new, new style of living. So It's almost like definition becomes kind of a filter in itself. Our specific definition, in a way, determines how we filter our perception of reality. Amy and I were talking the other day about, you know, certain people who really intensely feel 
everything going on in the world. I, I was talking to someone the other day in a session who was kind of overwhelmed by her experience of just the pain, suffering, and difficulty that she perceived in her life, not so much herself, but in other people. And I was kind of reflecting on that myself and realizing that I probably filter a lot of that out from some sense of self-preservation, that if, if I was really open to all that and taking it in and processing it, you know, especially with all of my openness and my design, if, if that factors in, I think I would probably be you know, rendered dysfunctional on a certain level. I don't, I don't think I'd be able to function uh, on a daily basis. And so I think you know, what we're really saying is that we are all filters of what is, of, of the consciousness field, but also just of life. And I wonder if we can look to the definition for that. Is that kind of what you were saying earlier, or am I reading too much into it? I mean, everything filters up, right? Everything is modulated in a way that the architecture can, that can handle it. What I'm saying is what we get to process, actually what comes out to our consciousness might be just a half a percent of everything we take in, even along the line of trauma or any, even in any, any topic. So meaning there is a filtration process on the way up because we can't possibly handle that kind of data. So we, the mind has a way of breaking it down into narrow blocks in a very tight story. Just like how we, you know, sort of summarize dream, how we get, well, dreams, <laughs> basically. And some people can do more than others. So I think it's all architecture of the brain and how it's done. But what I was talking about was how continual habit, habitual patterns lead to hardwired neural pathways. Mm -hmm. So in the context of making mental decisions, if you're making decisions and you've had trauma, then that trauma certainly gets into the decision-making process. Like if you've been beaten up at a club, well, next time you go to a club, certainly that's going to flash through. <laughs> it's going to give some feedback. So it's like that, that if, whatever trauma it might be, it's going to influence that decision, which is the whole point of deconditioning and, and inner authority. So what I'm saying is the only way to decouple it is not to use them, not to use those pathways. And by default, by switching to inner authority, we stop using those pathways. So along with that goes the story and the trauma and all of that. And in addition to that, we develop new ways to process information that we get, which I think is for everybody it becomes more and more efficient. That's what allows you to have room for awareness. Otherwise, it might be chattering all the time. You're not going to be aware of anything other than the chatter. So yeah, it was my, what I was talking about is more towards how to decouple the hard wiring that's related to decision making specifically. Yeah, it makes sense. But yeah, filters. Yeah, I think I can't even imagine the kind of information we pick up on a daily basis. <laughs> just just from every, not just from the neutrinos, but Jesus, from everything else. Just the neutrinos alone is enough to blow your mind, right? <laughs> <laughs> just that, just that. Mm -hmm. So imagine throwing in everything else on top of it. So. Yeah, I mean, especially in the world today, with everything we have access to. Everything coming at us every moment, really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think this correctness goes a long way towards that. I think eventually, you know, as you live correctly over time, you gravitate towards behavior that supports your life. And if certain things, certain information flows, upset it or disrupt the situation. And I think that you naturally turn away from that. Just like a flower naturally turns or a plant naturally turns towards the sun, you naturally move towards the correct trajectory mm -hmm. and not, be, not complain about the news or whatever and then be in it, right? But I think it happens without really a lot of conscious effort, just through correctness. That if you go from A to B to C to D, by the time you get to D, you know, half the things you don't require are not there. Not only that, the things that you require for the rest of the alphabet are lining up. So I think a lot to do with the correctness and less and less to do with sort of conscious decisions that we make, mental decisions like, oh, I don't want like, I like, I don't like this or I don't like that. So what, you know, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> you know? Because we can't, we don't know the future. We talked about the past and the future earlier. Like we're not going to know doing this mentally just for our comfort right now is going to pave the way where I'm going to be in seven years from now or six years or five years or next week. So you really have to, so let the body do it. 
because it knows. Me, I'm just thinking like with how much we could all be overwhelmed with just mentally, everything that we have access to. I mean, what, what a relief to have something like strategy and authority ever as a reference point for not, not feeling that you have to pay attention to and process everything, you know, <laughs> it's like, you'll, your brain will explode, especially now, <laughs> you know, it's, it's different when we didn't have this kind of access that we have. I like how, when Ra would sort of talk about the big, broad sort of cosmology of everything, how it could help us to really view ourselves as these, as these kind of tiny cells in these, in this much bigger organism and Mm -hmm. what a relief it is to just get to be the cell that you are, the particular differentiated thing that you are in your little place, in your little fractal, (laughs) in your little, in your Mm -hmm. little spot, patch of sunlight or darkness, wherever you live, you know, I just think that's such a huge relief. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Exactly. <laughs> and that's just a relief. It, it's, a, it's a must. Right. It's a, I mean, it's what's a, your other choice? To suffer <laughs> a <Yeah>. lot. <laughs> and, and, and just aimlessly suffer. To aimlessly suffer, yeah. And so I think that's why it's good, like John was saying earlier, to get it out to everybody, whoever wants it. Yeah. You know, so even the basics of knowing strategy and authority is enough just to not be in so much you know, in overloaded condition. Mm-hmm. You don't have to know everything to know that, do that. I think any level is fair game, right? Yep. And that's what I'm seeing, you know, some people are meant to only have that. Some people are meant to have more. You know, we were talking about education and comprehensive education, right? Yeah, some need it. Well, I'm talking about education to those who need it or where it's correct for them. Not that everybody needs it. Some people are fine with just strategy and authority and they're just, Floating away, just mm-hmm. perfectly <laughs> doing fine. <laughs> and for others, it takes a lot more, a lot more support to turn the ship around or get back in the right track. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's what's really uh, adds a variety to things. It's not that mechanical when it comes to the expression of things through people, you know. Well, it's, just, it's funny. I mean, I, I love the conversation we get to have, but I really have to say, honestly, I just, I really enjoy your frequency. Uh, and obviously a lot of people do, because I think people feel that in the, in just the way that, that you've attracted the kind of communities that you have on Facebook and in any, any other work you do in the world. So uh, I can just say that I just really enjoy your, your particular frequency. I'm grateful we get to talk with you and that you're up for chatting with us. Well, thanks. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, John. Well, it's likewise. I enjoy you guys. And that's why I'm here. I've been asked to do a lot of things. And I think this is the only human design related thing that I've been clear about doing. So it, which is an interesting thing altogether. (laughs) A lot of things, a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And I just don't get it. I just don't get a clearer pathway. But every time John says, Hey, you want to come and talk? I'm like, yeah, (laughs) it works. (laughs) <laughs> okay yeah <laughs> what to do what to do <laughs> that's interesting right isn't that so, it's a, that's so interesting it's a funny thing I, I got invited to do something at a event the other day and my will was just no I couldn't I couldn't get any movement out of it and it was just a no and then someone else associated with the same event came in and asked me a different question to do a different thing and it was just yes and I'm like ah, see there wow. you go I have no idea how that worked. It even surprised me. I'm like, I can't believe I just said yes to that. But, <laughs> but, I, but I feel okay. I feel okay doing it. So here we go. Exactly, exactly. This is what I mean. Some of these things I think like, wow, I should really do that. It'll be fun. It'll be this. It'll be that. So the logic is there, but it's just, you know, it's just not, uh, it's not a thing to move on. Yeah. And uh, so you guys are like the only thing I move on. <laughs> oh, <laughs> For whatever reason. Thank you. That's so it's amazing to me. Sure. Yeah. Well, cool. It all works. It it goes both ways. All right. Well, thank you. This has been good. I guess we'll leave it at that. Yeah. Thanks, you guys. Thank you for listening to the Human Design Collective podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please review us and share. You can find us at humandesigncollective.com and explore our course and workshop offerings at courses.humandesigncollective.com. Music for the Human Design Collective podcast is courtesy of Anders Parker.
For more information, see the show notes. And please stay tuned for upcoming episodes on the same channel. But you were there.